So last summer, my lawnmower broke. To fix it, I did some Google searches on the symptoms, identified the likely problem, and then I went to YouTube. I watched a few videos on shear pins, and I fixed my lawnmower. Now, YouTube did not make me an instant mechanic, but I learned how to fix this particular problem in a just-in-time or on-demand sort of way. And today, technology makes this kind of learning more possible than it has ever been before. If I want to learn how to cook French toast or to tie a bow tie, I can go to YouTube, learn the skill, and apply it. Maybe we even remember how to do it next year when we want to wear a bow tie again. Or, if you're like me, maybe not. But also, when I learn to fix the shear pin, I still don't have any idea how to adjust the carburetor or even whether my neighbor's lawnmower has shear pins in it at all. I learned something very important for me at the time, but very specialized. I learned just enough to fix my problem. Now, the same week that I was fixing my lawnmower, I was also trying to determine how my university should deal with a worsening pandemic. How should we balance the health of students, faculty, and staff, and the local community? We were trying to answer questions about testing and housing and remote instruction. Now, and I tried looking up some of these questions on the web, and somehow Google didn't have the answer. So I concluded that not everything can be learned from the internet. Now, there's a lot of discussion today about how the kind of just-in-time learning that helped me fix my mower will impact the future of higher education. Some people are convinced that we're moving towards a future in which most learning occurs remotely, asynchronously, on demand, and at large scale, and thus that the traditional residential college education is at risk of becoming obsolete. I think there's some truth in these views, but I think that they miss what is most important about higher education. Don't get me wrong, on-demand learning is great for some things, and it will have an important impact on higher education. Students in calculus class already can use the internet to find help with many of their homework problems. Students learning French can use language learning apps such as Duolingo to refine their comprehension and conversation skills. The internet is an incredible bank of useful information that is easy to find and apply when we have a problem that people anywhere on the planet already know how to solve. Universities certainly have some things to learn from these approaches, such as the kind of flexibility that they allow. I would have been incredibly frustrated to go online to learn how to fix my lawnmower, only to find that the next course in lawnmower repair started in September. But these stories fail to identify the essence of what universities, and especially research universities, do best. They also fail to make clear what would be lost if all learning became on demand or just in time. But before I go too far, I think it's important to note that we have many kinds of colleges and universities in this country that serve many different people with many educational needs. My focus here is on the special role of the residential research university, places like Lehigh, and Penn, and Temple, and Johns Hopkins. And I fully acknowledge that as a group, we're mostly serving 18 to 22-year-olds who have the luxury of spending four years not having a job and paying us for their education. But the kind of education that universities like these provide is about preparing for the unexpected, the unanticipated, and the unknown. It's not just about learning facts or even skills. Put another way, the most important thing that universities do is to teach students knowledge and skills before they need them, discover knowledge before we know that it's useful, and build an environment in which diverse groups of people connect with each other before they even know why they might want to connect. In doing these things, I think of universities as building a kind of strategic reserve of knowledge, skills, mindsets, and relationships that help individuals and our society to survive and thrive in circumstances that we have never seen before, to solve problems that not even the internet knows how to answer. So what do I mean by a strategic reserve? A strategic, strategic reserve is a kind of stockpile of something that is accumulated just in case. The US has a strategic petroleum reserve. We have a reserve of helium, and we have a reserve of N95 masks. A less commonly known strategic reserve is held on an island off the coast of Norway called Svalbard. 
on this island, in an abandoned coal mine, is a strategic reserve of more than one million kinds of seeds. Yes, seeds. Seeds that could grow into corn or tomatoes or apple trees. This seed reserve was created as a kind of backup of the important plants on the planet. If there is ever a global blight that kills off all of the coffee plants, or perhaps if modern farming and climate change dramatically reduce the diversity of plant life on the planet, species that were lost could be brought out of the reserve. We could, for example, try to restart coffee production from the seeds in that bank. The variety of seeds on Svalbard is more like the strategic reserve that universities create. So how do universities create strategic reserves, and, and when is it that they're tapped? So university research pr produces strategic reserves of new knowledge that are a kind of insurance against an uncertain future. One recent ex example of how such reserves get used is very topical. Over the last few decades, university research produced new knowledge that allowed us to rapidly produce effective vaccines, such as those against COVID-19. Given the history of vaccine research, the development and deployment of more than two dozen safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines worldwide, with three receiving approval here in the US, in a little over a year is an unprecedented achievement. By comparison, vaccines against polio were tested as early as 1935, but it was not until 1952 that the vaccine developed by Jonas Salk was tested at large scale, and not until 1955 that it was formally approved. More recently, in the early 1980s, it became clear that human papillomavirus caused many cases of cervical cancer. But it took until 2006 before a vaccine was developed, tested, and approved. Imagine where we would be today if we were still 20 years away from a COVID vaccine. Now, the rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines has been possible because of years of previous investment in university research on viruses, mRNA, and vaccines. The knowledge gained from this research has functioned as a strategic knowledge reserve in areas of life sciences and medicine. So, so what was in this knowledge reserve that was so important? Now, after the outbreaks of other coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, in the early 2000s, scientists worked to build a picture of the structure of coronaviruses. Some of this work built a picture of the so-called spike protein that is involved in making the COVID-19 virus so transmissible. The spike protein is like the key that the virus uses to unlock its way into our cells. The picture of the spike protein that was developed has been critical to the development of COVID vaccines. Using this picture, scientists were able to make a, a version of the protein that is frozen in exactly the configuration that it takes at the moment that it binds to human cells. All of the most effective COVID vaccines instruct our cells to make antibodies against the spike protein frozen at this critical moment. Therefore, the vaccines tell our bodies how to produce antibodies that are maximally effective. Now, the knowledge about the structure of the spike protein in coronaviruses served as a seed that was ready to be planted when we needed to create vaccines against COVID-19. If this knowledge was not in our reserve at the time of the COVID outbreak, vaccines might have been delayed for years or decades. Beyond research, as part of our educational mission, universities seek to create a strategic reserve of knowledge and skill in each one of our students. We are preparing our students for the unknown futures that they will encounter. Preparing students for their first job is essential, but it's not good enough. We need to prepare them for jobs that don't yet exist, experiences they don't know they will have, and challenges that we cannot predict. We do this by teaching students in a wide range of subjects. Students major in disciplines like economics or physics that have a structure, a set of skills, a way of thinking, and a set of standards of evidence and proof. But most of our physics majors will not be physicists. And most of our philosophy majors will not be philosophers. Now, if this is true, then you might say, why bother? Why teach students physics if they won't be physicists? Can't we just teach them a little bit of physics just before they might need it? When will they ever use this information? And now, the truthful answer is that we don't know when or even how they will use the specific knowledge that they gain. But this is part of my point. Our goal as universities in educating students is to prepare our students to solve new problems, to answer new questions, and to give students experience working with others as they face the unknown and the unexpected. 
in an opinion piece in the New York Times a few years ago. The former Treasury Secretary and Goldman Sachs co-chair Robert Rubin wrote that the class that prepared him best for both working at Goldman Sachs and being Secretary of the Treasury was not an economics class or a finance class, but a philosophy class. Rubin wrote that learning about existentialism while an undergraduate brought him a sense of calm that served him well in the difficult situations that he faced in his career. Learning to think like a philosopher allowed him to accept that in many cases there are no provable certainties, but only probabilities to be analyzed. And this was the preparation that he needed to function amid financial crisis and when dealing with Congress amid government shutdowns. Rubin's philosophy class created in him the habits and mindset that functioned as a reserve to be called upon, not only when considering philosophical questions, but when confronting volatile markets and political crises. This preparation for the unknown and the unknowable was achieved by his engagement with the big ideas and unsolvable problems of philosophy in a way that is essential, an essential part of the university's mission. Now, perhaps the most underappreciated reserve that universities create is a reserve of diverse relationships and human connections that we call upon at times throughout our lives. These relationships come in many forms. Students connect with other students. Students are mentored by faculty and by staff. While a student is in college, these relationships create the learning environment that they inhabit and contribute to the student's sense of belonging and success. After college, these connections made by students are durable, often extending for years or decades beyond college. This network of relationships helps us later in life as we look for jobs, when we consider changing careers, when we move to a new city, or when we just seek connection in times of stress. A few years ago, I heard a talk by a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, Matt Rogers, one of the co-founders of Nest. What I recall from that conversation was the importance that he attached to the connections that he and his fellow entrepreneurs had developed during college. At the most crucial and stressful times, he relied on these connections to find mentors and potential employees. Many successful alumni talk about how their former professors have served as long-standing sources of guidance and wisdom. Surveys of college students by Gallup and other organizations have consistently shown that one of the strongest predictors of the success of college graduates decades later is the degree to which they had faculty and staff who cared about their success. So these relationships have lasting impact. These deep relationships are formed by the residential experience of college and by the sense of shared purpose and community that universities seek to create. Such relationships need to be fostered by the environment in which we live and cannot be created on demand or via remote approaches to education. Now, for each of these strategic reserves, universities, especially research universities, are among the only institutions on the planet dedicated to creating them. The special role of the research university was essentially invented after World War II. Imagine if this had not happened, or perhaps more to the point, imagine if universities of this sort were simply replaced by a new version of YouTube based in just-in-time learning. Over time, we would deplete our reserves of research, of knowledge, of skills, and connections. After the 20 or 30 years, we would be far less prepared to address the unexpected challenges, the next pandemic, the next global threat. As the world becomes more complex and the pace of change increases, the unexpected will become more likely, the unthinkable will occur, and the role of universities in preparing us to survive and thrive in this future becomes ever more important. Because not every problem is as easy to fix as a broken lawnmower. Thank you.